Right then guys, it's PSL here and I'm here for the 8th episode in my Stuart Manager career mode on Grand Prix World. And this is finally the episode in which I announce the drivers I have signed for next season. So in the previous episode, I asked you guys to leave down in the comments the drivers you reckon I have signed for next season. And I was looking through the comments and by far and away the most common driver pairing you guys came up with was Pedro Diniz and Mika Hakkinen. It makes perfect sense, Pedro Diniz is the highest paying, highest skilled pay driver in the game. And Mika Hakkinen, again makes sense because, rather suspiciously, Mika Hakkinen hasn't been retained by McLaren for next season, nor has he been signed by any of the top teams. Williams, Benetton, Ferrari, McLaren and Jordan have all signed three drivers, and they've announced those drivers and none of them are Mika Hakkinen. So unless Hakkinen is at Stewart, or unless he makes a shock move to Sauber, then he hasn't been retained by any team for next season. So my driver lineup for next season will be Pedro Diniz, Tora Takaki, and then John Fellows as our test driver. Pedro Diniz signed him straight away, just before, well yeah, just before the Australian Grand Prix, so before the first race of the season, I signed Pedro Diniz. Here are his stats on the screen now, you can see 2 star speed, 2 star skill. His stats are okay, decent wet weather driver that could be helpful, decent concentration, 5 out of 5 morale, I'm not really sure how helpful that is, but I mean considering we've got a morale crisis in the team, that might be helpful. You may think, why on earth have I signed Taranasuki Takaki, well look, Takaki will be paying us 6.4 million dollars next season. That's how I'm able to excuse 1 out of 5 speed, 1 out of 5 skill, 1 out of 5 overtaking, 1 out of 5 wet weather. That's how I'm able to excuse all of that. And that's because he's paying us $6.4 million. And we'll only be stuck with him for one season, so that helps. We can get rid of him quickly if we need to. So, yes, we've got Takaki paying us $6.4 million. Next season, Pedro Diniz will be paying us $9.6 million. Hakkinen has not been signed by me. It really does look like, unless Hakkinen has been signed by, or will be signed by, Sauber, or unless something amazing happens, then Mecha Hakkinen will not be racing in 1999. There's the driver stats for Barrichello and Magnussen, just to give you some sort of comparison. So, Diniz is not as skilled as Barrichello. Takaki is slightly less skilled than Magnussen. They're about the same, really, though, to be honest. We entered this season with $9.8 million that Ford have paid us. Pedro Diniz is paying us, what, 9.6? Pedro Diniz is basically replacing the lost money from Ford, because next season, well, we've got Ferrari engines and Ferrari are paying us $275,000. We're lucky to be getting a dollar from them. So that's why I've signed Pedro Diniz. He's there to replace the lost money from Ford. And then Takaki, the $6 million from him basically ensure that we're in a better position financially next season compared to this season. Because as we've seen so far this season, we've been losing money the past few Grand Prix. We can only afford to go testing sparingly. We've just been in a bad way financially. Takaki will give us the money to actually do stuff, to go testing more regularly. And then, well, the benefits we will get from testing will be profound. Because if we go testing more often, we can do more development. We can aid research of new parts, new chassis, new driver aids, it keeps the morale high which keeps productivity high. So that's the thing, is money is important. And that's why I've got Takaki. I can excuse Takaki being a dreadful driver because he will allow us to do so much more. I haven't talked about chassis in this game yet and considering how important they are to a team's overall performance, I really should do. 
So I've just finished the second design stage so I can now apply 100% of my design staff onto the next stage and I really do need to apply the entirety of the staff. Because for the past, oh, I don't know how long, a long time, we haven't had any design staff working on a technology upgrade or a driver raid upgrade because we just can't spare the people. I mean, you know, I mean, the morale in our design department is 1 out of 5, effort is 60%. That means that the progress we were making on our chassis design was being slowed down massively. Now that's bad, it's really bad actually because... Okay, so you get the progress bars, as you can see. Now the progress bars, you can actually finish a design stage without filling up the progress bar, but if you end a design stage early, then that impacts your chassis next season. So this season's chassis for Stuart was originally rated 40%, it's now 46% because we did a mid-season chassis update. So the best this chassis can be rated is 40%. The reason for that is because our chief designer is rated 2 out of 5. So 40%. If our chief designer was rated 3 out of 5 as they will be next season, then the best chassis they can produce is a 60% chassis. So this is why Rory Byrne is such a useful person to have because Rory Byrne, the only 5 star rated chief designer, can produce a 100% rated chassis. He is the only guy in the Formula 1 paddock that can produce a perfect chassis. Well, Neil Oatley, of course, in theory could Neil Oatley's chassis could be at best 80% at the start and then you could do lots of mid-season chassis upgrades to take it up towards 100%. Our current chief designer, he's 2 out of 5 rated, that means his peak is 40%. But if I was to end the model design stage early, which I might have to do, I might have to end the model design or wind tunnel stage early because well, you need to design the chassis before the end of the season. In fact, before the season ends, so before the Japanese Grand Prix starts, you need to design the chassis and then manufacture two of them. So this is why the engineering side is important as well, and that's why, you know, morale hitting the engineering staff hard isn't great either, and, you know, the lack of spare parts really doesn't help. If I filled up all four progress bars, the chassis would be rated 40%. But, because we might, probably will actually, have to cut off the chassis design early, it won't be rated 40%, it will be rated... I don't know, probably 38, 37, 36%. The point is, is we've got a really bad chief designer, which means the chassis is going to be, by default, the joint worst on the grid. But, because morale is so low, productivity is low, because productivity is low, we probably won't be able to fully complete the design work on the chassis, and that means that the chassis will be even worse than it could be. So we started off this season with the joint worst chassis on the grid. Because we might not finish designing next season's chassis properly, that means we could start off next season with possibly the worst chassis on the grid. The only way we won't is if Minardi or Tyrrell or one of the other teams that has a 2 out of 5 rated chief designer ends their chassis design even earlier than we do. So then let's finally get into the 1998 German Grand Prix around Hockenheim, the old layout of Hockenheim. So then, conditions are apparently very dry. Not just dry, but very dry. But then again, if the temperature's 30 degrees, that doesn't surprise me one little bit. So then, there's been no upgrades in terms of engines, tyres, unsurprisingly really, so let's head on into the qualifying for the 1998 German Grand Prix. And this is a power circuit. 
And bearing in mind we have a Ford engine, I'm not really fancying our chances here. However, this might be one of the few Grand Prix where we can actually definitively beat Arrows, because Arrows previously this season have been, well, on a similar pace to us, but when push comes to shove they've been the slightly quicker team. But the heart engine they use is the least powerful engine on the grid. And yeah, sure, the Ford engine is lacking power, but it's more powerful. And around this circuit, that should be massively helpful. So, let's see how well we do. Barrichello qualified in 12th, Magnussen down in 16th. Our qualifying performances really are getting worse. No one was disqualified. So that's good news. That's really good news, actually. So that means that towards the front... Michael Schumacher has taken pole position for the 1998 German Grand Prix, his home Grand Prix. Well, the thing is though, is taking pole position is one thing, I mean, he hasn't been disqualified yet. But, there's nothing to say that he couldn't be disqualified in the race, there's nothing to say that he won't retire in the race, because Ferrari's reliability recently has been shocking, really shocking. Luca Badoa, on the face of it, looks so inferior compared to Michael Schumacher. But look at the actual qualifying times. Badoa was only about three tenths of a second off. So yeah, sure, he's five positions further on down the field, but it's not a case of Padoa's massively slower. It's just a case of the field is really tightly packed. Frentzen qualified in second. That's a really good qualifying position for both himself and Williams, probably one of, if not their best, this season to date. Fizzy Keller in third, Jacques Villeneuve fourth, Alexander Wurtz in fifth, Luca Badoa in sixth. If Luca Badoa looks inferior compared to Michael Schumacher, then how do McLaren look? McLaren have qualified in seventh and eighth, and bearing in mind they've got the Mercedes engine, the most powerful engine on the grid, that's really surprising. Yeah, sure, Ferrari do have advantages over McLaren, and if it was just Michael Schumacher that beat Hakkinen and Coulthard, I wouldn't be too surprised. But McLaren lost out to Frentzen, to Fizzy Keller, to Villeneuve, to Wurtz, to Padoa. How? McLaren were the quickest team by some margin in real life in 1998. But here they've only qualified in 7th and 8th, and this is one of these circuits I expected them to do best around. The good thing for McLaren is that they're a fair way ahead of the best of the rest. In fact, the top four teams are quite some way ahead of everyone else. Damon Hill is six tenths behind David Coulthard. So there's a light amount of rain falling down onto the Hockenheim circuit. I really doubt that is going to help us out unless there's a lot of retirement enough to promote our guys up into the points places. But bearing in mind how dreadfully we should be doing in wet or especially intermediate tyre conditions, a lot, and I really do mean a lot, of drivers would need to retire. But who knows, we might get lucky, so will we? No we won't, in fact I think both of our guys retired. Both with engine failures, fantastic, right! I was just saying that, well I was just saying earlier on that this race might not be too bad for us compared to Arrows because we've got the more powerful engine, as it turns out we've got the unreliable engine, both of our drivers retired from the German Grand Prix early due to engine failures. Shinji Nakano retired due to a personal mistake, but Doa, look at Doa! Retired again. Again, that is Ferrari driver number two luck. An electronics issue for Luca Badoa. Giancarlo Fizzi Keller was disqualified. So, that's really bad for Benetton. But then again, they shouldn't be running illegal driver eight. And Alexander Wurtz only finished the Grand Prix in sixth. So it's really not been a good Grand Prix for Benetton. One driver disqualified and the other driver only finished in sixth. That's only one point they scored, which really isn't good because that's five less than Williams, who they're competing with in the Constructors' Championship as Heinz Frentzen finished in second. 
Damon Hill, just like I said, I said the conditions would help him out because, well, in another wet weather Grand Prix, Damon Hill finished on the podium. Damon Hill finished in third. One lap behind Michael Schumacher, but then again, given all the advantages Michael Schumacher has compared to Damon Hill, that really isn't surprising. So Michael Schumacher won the 1998 German Grand Prix, and he won it lapping every other driver in the field. Heinz Alfredson in second, one lap down. Damon Hill in third, one lap down. Jonah Lacy finished in fourth and only one lap down. Hakkinen finished in fifth, two laps down. So a Lacy was lapped one less time than Mika Hakkinen. I'm wondering if Jean Lacy is a wet weather specialist as well. I'm wondering if Frenson is. Frenson might not be, but Jean Lacy. A result like that, that just screams that he must be decent in wet weather. His wet weather stats must be fairly decent. Naturally, the results from that Grand Prix have had quite a profound effect on the Drivers' Championship. Mika Hakkinen is still leading it, but only by one point. He's got 44 points to his name. Michael Schumacher is only one point behind him. It's very much a Hakkinen versus Michael Schumacher Drivers' Championship battle. Alexander Wurz is still in third, still ahead of David Coulthard, Giancarlo Fisichella. Heinzold Frentzen is now tied with Eddie Irvine in the Drivers' Championship. Jacques Villeneuve only one point behind Irvine and his teammates. So actually, both Williams drivers have been incredibly equally matched. Damon Hill and John Alesi, the two overachievers this season. Ralph Schumacher's got four points to his name, then it's Deniz, Barrichello, who have both got three points, which is three times as many as Padoa and Mika Salo. And of course, Pedro Deniz beating Luca Padoa, but more importantly, beating Mika Salo in the Drivers' Championship bodes well for us next season, because if Pedro Deniz is beating his teammate Mika Salo, then he clearly can't be that bad. In the Constructors' Championship, there isn't really much to report. McLaren are still leading the Constructors' Championship, but their lead over Ferrari has been cut. They're now only ahead of Ferrari by 3 points. Benetton are only 10 points behind Ferrari. Williams are only 10 points behind Benetton. It is still incredibly close at the top. And also this Grand Prix, Williams were plainly better than Benetton, so... Benetton, by no stretch of the imagination, have got third place in the Constructors' Championship wrapped up. Williams could still do it. Jordan have pulled away from Sauber, Sauber have pulled away from Arrows, and then of course it's Arrows with four points and ourselves in three points, and then Minardi and Tyrrell, because they still haven't scored a point, don't even get listed on the Constructors' Championship, which is... Quite disrespectful, I mean they are competing in the season at least, at least have the courtesy to stick them there at the bottom, but no, apparently they don't even get that, they're just not even acknowledged as being in the Constructors' Championship. You can tell we're getting towards the end of the season because there's only seven pages worth of news. Not only that, but the amount of news there's been post each Grand Prix has lessened recently. We already know, of course, that Stewart had a nightmare race with both drivers failing to finish, and I really didn't want to be reminded. Anyway, moving on, Arrows will be buying fuel from Elf next year, and Ferrari has signed a joint venture deal with Elf next season. McLaren and Bridgestone have entered into a partnership arrangement, and so have Prost. What is this? Are Prost just copying McLaren? Because at the exact same time that McLaren signed a works deal with Mercedes, so did Prost. And now at the exact same time that McLaren have signed a partnership deal with Bridgestone, so are Prost. Are Prost just copying McLaren? It certainly does seem like it, but then again, there are worse teams to emulate, so fair enough. But it's, it's quite strange. To be honest, Prost... Someone did comment this in the previous episode, actually, that I've said all season that Prost 
you know, that it's embarrassing to be beaten by Prost and, you know, I've been kind of berating Prost all season, partly because I'm just annoyed at the fact that they've got a team sponsor and we don't, because they've got it on historical success, but if you were going on current pace, we would have it and they wouldn't. So yeah, I mean, I've been annoyed with Prost from the get-go, but um, someone did comment that it's ironic that, you know, I've been saying it's been embarrassing to be beaten by Prost, but, you know, Prost are shaping up to be a really good team, or at least a... In fact, no, they're shaping up to be a really good team in the future. Mercedes engines on the works deal, a partner Bridgestone deal, they've got Rory Byrne, the best chief designer on the grid next season. Prost very quickly could be a very, very good team. Nathan Quinn, myself, well, I have been voted as the worst F1 manager. To be fair, if you're going off of the recent Grand Prix, fair enough. In qualifying, Barrichello did about as good as usual. Magnussen, worse than usual. I think that's the worst qualifying performance we had all season. In the race, a double retirement. Fair enough. Who's manager of the month? Frank Williams. Okay, fair enough. I'm just happy it's not Ron Dennis or Jean Todd. Frank Williams, fair enough actually, because Williams have... In the most recent Grand Prix, Williams certainly outperformed Benetton, and for that upturn in performance, yeah, Frank Williams rightly does deserve Manager of the Month. I mean, there are other managers you could give the award to, but certainly I don't think Frank Williams is undeserving of the award. That's some good news, and that is that we have completed negotiations with Brembo, so we can sign the deal, and Brembo will be sponsoring us next season, and crucially, they will be paying us $1.4 million. So we can take off that 35%. We've actually done quite well with sponsors. Oh, and we've got a two-season deal with Hewlett-Packard. $1 million, okay. That's not bad, that's fine, another $1 million, I'll happily take that. So that's two sponsorship deals signed already. Hang on, we've, we've also completed the deal with Vistium, what? Another two season sponsorship deal securing $1.2 million, again. Again, another sponsor snapped up. Have we actually, if we've done this, I'll be amazed. Oh, not quite. I I was wondering whether I'd actually filled up all the sponsor slots because I certainly wasn't expecting to fill up the sponsor slots this season at least. But actually, we could well do it. There's only one sponsor slot free. So we've got more sponsors secured for next season than we've got sponsoring us this season. Fantastic news! Ford have given us an updated engine in time for the Hungarian Grand Prix, and it is... It's one higher in the heat rating, one higher in the power rating, that's very helpful, and one higher in the response rating. That's great news, I really wish it came in for the German Grand Prix, and also curiously, they haven't updated the reliability rating. Now, considering that we had two engine failures in the previous Grand Prix, and considering that, even disregarding that, the reliability rating is the worst on this engine, you would have expected Ford to have improved the reliability, but apparently not. With all that said, let's head on into the 1998 Hungarian Grand Prix. Okay, so there's a light amount of rain falling onto the circuit, so it's an intermediate tyre condition qualifying session, so we all know what to expect. It should be a Michael Schumacher pole position unless he gets disqualified. Well, this is sort of what I expected. Damon Hill is towards the front, in fact, at the very front. Damon Hill has taken pole position ahead of Michael Schumacher in second. The two wet weather specialists are the top two, but in the opposite order to what I thought they'd be in. And in fact, actually, not only did I not expect Damon Hill to beat Michael Schumacher, in no way did I think it was guaranteed he would beat both McLarens, but 
Well, looking at where Raul Schumacher qualified, actually, I think Jordan are just going to do well here this Grand Prix. Both Jordan drivers have got the speed because Raul Schumacher this season hasn't really been amazing. Certainly, he's been inferior compared to Damon Hill, but for Ralph Schumacher to qualify in fifth, Jordan are certainly looking good here. Okay, actually, okay, I'm glad I scrolled down. I mean, I kind of needed to to see where our guys were at, but it's... It's a very interesting bottom end, because, okay, Salo Herbert, truly, Barrichello, that's not a surprise, but Luca Badoa, driving for Ferrari, let's not forget, qualified in 16th. How on earth is he going to explain that one? 16th place, he's several seconds a lap behind his teammate. And yeah, sure, Michael Schumacher is a wet weather specialist, but Padoa... Padoa really has made himself look like the driver number two. Padoa was outqualified by Barrichello. Rosset and Tuero must have been painfully slow in qualifying because Magnussen isn't too far off of the 107 cent time, he's only about a tenth off. Nakano a couple of tenths off, Panis about four tenths off. I mean, you know, they're reasonably close. But Takaki, Takaki is two seconds a lap slower than the 107% time. Yet they still allowed him to race, but not Rosset or Tuero. Either the FIA just hate Rosset and Tuero, or they must have gone incredibly slowly to be even slower than Takaki. I mean, I mean, to not be allowed to race, they must have been dreadful, utterly, utterly dreadful. And also, actually, Takaki, yeah, sure, he did dreadfully in qualifying. I mean, really, really dreadfully. And actually, even slower than Nakano, so that really doesn't look good. Bearing in mind, I've signed Takaki for next season. But Takaki did still beat his teammate. So, Takaki, certainly, he's not looking dreadful, which, bearing in mind, I'll be stuck with him for a season. That's good news for me. So this is going to be the exact opposite of the German Grand Prix, not least because the Hungara Ring is a polar opposite circuit compared to the old layout of Hockenheim. But also, the German Grand Prix saw a very dry qualifying session and then a light rain race, whereas the Hungarian Grand Prix has seen a light rain qualifying session and then a very dry race. Well, I hasn't seen the race yet because, of course, we do need to set all this up. Well, I say set it up. There's nothing really for me to do. Don't need to change the race strategy because, well, I'll probably mess it up anyway. And a two-stop strategy. Yep, that sounds fair enough to me. So let's see. Let's see how well we do. And in fact, much better than I expected. Barrichello in seventh. That's a massive upturn in pace. So I do want to say... Thank you to Ford. Thank you, Ford, for giving us the upgraded engine because, well, I mean, there's been no other upgrades recently. And we haven't finished this close to the points places in a while. So thank you, Ford. Also, massive, massive thank you to Rubens Barrichello. He finished in seventh. He beat on raw speed and raw speed alone, Giancarlo Fisichella and Mika Hakkinen. Mika Hakkinen in ninth. What on earth happened there? So let's look further on down the field. If wow, McLaren. If McLaren had a bad German Grand Prix, they've had a beyond abysmal. Hungarian Grand Prix. Hakkinen, incredibly slow. Incredibly. Didn't score a point, wasn't even close to scoring a point. And David Coulthard retired due to an accident. Magnussen retired again, so that's more damage sustained onto the car. Fantastic. But towards the front, Michael Schumacher won the 1998 Hungarian Grand Prix comfortably. He was a good 17 seconds ahead of Heinz Howard Frensen, who's taken his second second place finish in a row. Alexander Wurtz in third, Jean Alexi in fourth. That's another solid points place finish for Jean Alexi. 
I have to say, Jean Lacy is making Johnny Herbert look dreadful. Because the only real accurate barometer for drivers is how they compare to their teammate. And Jean Lacy, he's done pretty well considering the team he's in and the car he's got. And massively outperformed Johnny Herbert. I don't think Johnny Herbert has scored a single point, And Jean Lacy has got more points finishes than Johnny Herbert has got points. Luca Badoa finished in 5th despite qualifying in 16th, so that's a fantastic result. And also, more points for Luca Badoa. Luca Badoa didn't retire from the Grand Prix. Thank you. So in the Drivers' Championship, with Michael Schumacher getting some finishes under his belt, he is now leading the Drivers' Championship, 9 points ahead of Mecca Hakkinen. Hakkinen, his season's just fallen apart. Where's the pace gone? Mecca Hakkinen, at the start of the season, was getting podium finishes easily, winning Grand Prix. Now, he can barely score a point. Alexander Wirtz still third in the Drivers' Championship, and rightly so. However, if Heinz Howard Frensen takes third in the Drivers' Championship off of him, then fair enough. I'll be honest, Wirtz more than deserves third place in the Drivers' Championship, but recently, Heinz Howard Frensen has done enough to take third place especially as he's outperformed Jacques Villeneuve, but then again, Wurtz has beaten Giancarlo Fisichella. That could be an incredibly good championship battle between Damon Hill and Jean Lacy for ninth place. Damon Hill and Jean Lacy, the best drivers not to be driving for a top four team. I mean, they're certainly doing much better than Ralph Schumacher, Luca Badoa, who is driving for a top four team. Pedro Diniz in joint 12th, actually, that's quite a club. Luca Badoa, Pedro Diniz, and Rubens Barrichello all in joint 12th. At the end of the German Grand Prix, I mentioned that Tyrrell and Minardi weren't mentioned in the Constructors' Championship, but of course neither are Prost. Prost still haven't scored a point this season. And moving up towards the front of the Constructors' Championship, Ferrari have taken the lead, but they've only got a 9 points lead over McLaren. So if McLaren can refine their mojo, then it could still be McLaren who win the Constructors' Championship. But, well, it's it just seems to be going in trends. Ferrari, they've had their ups and downs. McLaren certainly have. So it just depends which team spends the rest of the season on top. Because if Ferrari suffer more reliability issues, disqualifications, or if McLaren just up their pace again, then... McLaren could well win the Constructors' Championship. Really, it is difficult to predict. Wow, that is some wording. Benetton and Shell have agreed a deal that is a part of a major new F1 alliance. That's some bold claims right there, and it's the same with Jordan. Jordan and Shell apparently have agreed a deal that will form a major new Formula 1 alliance. Okay, what else is there? Andrea Montemini will be... He'll be racing for Tyrrell. Is that true? Racing? So Montemini is their current test driver. Has he got a promotion? I mean, I know it says racing, but does it actually mean racing? I mean, either way, I mean, Montemini, he's still at Tyrrell. But if he's got a promotion up to a race driver, that's brilliant news for him. Or he could still be their test driver, I mean, regardless. I mean, the point is, I mean, we have got rid of Takaki from Tyrrell, so they do need to fill the Takaki gap, and I think they might have just done that by promoting their test driver. So then, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, be sure to leave a like, comment down below, and I'll see you guys in the next episode as we rapidly approach the end of the first season in this series. So we've now seen most of the 1998 season, and you now know entirely how the Stewart team will shape up for the 1999 season. So of course, if you haven't done already, be sure to leave down in the comments your reaction to my driver signings for next season, and also your predictions for next season, because we've got a reasonably good idea of how all of the teams will shape up next season. Of course, you can check out all of the signings made by all of the teams in the description. And yeah, be sure to leave down your 
predictions for the 99 season because very soon we will be getting into the second season in this career mode. But before then, we've got just four rounds of this season left to go, starting off with the 1998 Belgian Grand Prix at Spa-Francorchamps. So I'll see you guys in the next episode.